Hello and welcome to another video and podcast from fantasyfootballscout.co.uk. My name is David and once again I'm joined by Mark who comes to us live from the Fantasy Football Scout writer's room where it never stops. The football season has come to a halt but the articles keep on coming and the big series that they are working on right now and we're of course tracking our, on uh, our videos and podcasts is the team of the season. So here we are once again Mark, we've talked about goalkeepers and defenders, we're moving on to the uh, the explosive points deliverers themselves the midfielders so uh yeah must be must be good fun going back and having a look at some of the players in this position yes it is it's um it's very much a what lessons have we learned uh, time of year so it is interesting to look back and just uh, look beyond the points totals of each player and, and just see how it happened uh what didn't happen and yeah and just get thinking ahead for next season really and the midfield uh, position is, is definitely one I've always enjoyed having to look back on because there's a lot more variation of choice than, say, in your goalkeepers and defenders. You know, they're very much the sort of um, the bread and butter, whereas uh, the midfielders quite often can be the juicy filling that bring mm-hmm. some real flavour to your team. So, uh, although, speaking of bread and butter, we do actually start in a place that feels very bread and butter, very mainstay in Mohamed Salah. Although it has been a really interesting season. I mean, reviewing his season is probably as interesting now as it has been in a long time because he didn't quite hit the heights uh, that you would expect from him, but he did become essential uh, eventually, uh, just like the days of old. So, yeah, talk me through his campaign and what we've learned and what perhaps that might mean for next season. Yeah, it was it, it was similar to what we said about Trent Alexander-Arnold, really, in that for the first half of the, the campaign... World Cup, he was he was pretty. Well, it wasn't so much lower down the midfielders list, but he certainly wasn't at the top. He'd only scored six before the World Cup. Even going into game week twenty five, he was on eight, which which for him is substandard. But then, and of course, at the start of the season, he blanked in the nine nil against Bournemouth. I don't know if you captained him, but I, I know I did. It's hard to forget that. It was a hard day uh, that one. Very hard day. <laughs> really tough day. But yeah, he's emerged. Once it's all said and done, he's the top scoring midfielder. And he's one of only two to have double digits for goals and assists. So yeah, you, you look at you look at it like that and think it's more Salah being more Salah. But for a while he wasn't quite uh what we what we knew of him. But certainly towards the end of the season, he be, his final fifteen matches brought eleven goals seven assists and he found time to miss two penalties so <laughs> he he really he was making up for lost time by the end yeah absolutely well i mean it'd be really interesting to see how he fares in the vote on fantasy football scout um dot uk where you can vote uh, for who you think should be in the team of the season now mohammed salah has obviously come up number one on the shortlist so far based purely i'm going to assume uh the fact that he he, he was the top scorer midfielder in the end do, do you feel that he is going to make that um team of the season from the votes i mean how do you see the voters uh um voting uh, what, where, where are they going to um, tick the right boxes. Do you feel that Salah's going to make the the top three, top four? Um, even though it wasn't quite wasn't quite a usual Salah season, because the price is the big thing here as well, isn't it? You know, price is the big thing because as we'll find out on this list, it's, 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 you've got more midfield nominees than any other positions, and that's because there was quite a decent number of mid-priced uh, stars this season. So. Um, if it comes to sort of picking a team of the season with a budget, and we'll move on to forwards in, in the next video, but if you have Haaland and Kane, for example, that maybe restricts Salah, and that's okay because we've got lots of good options in midfield and 8 million. So uh, it's it's it could go either way, I think. Yeah, we, we, Salah. we like things like that. We like a little bit of postseason drama, I think. Um, and well, the thing is, the, the other thing is that I think this year more than ever before, we were just inundated with uh, value midfielders um, in, in a number of different price brackets from down from the, right down to the 4.5s uh, into the 5.5s, the 6.5s, things like that, which to be honest, the, the, the premium midfielder wasn't really a slot this year. And there weren't even that many that were priced that way to begin with. There was only five, I think, that were priced above 9.5, I think, um, you know, Salah, um, De Bruyne, Sterling, Son, and 
uh, Bruno, I think. Yeah. So there, were, no. there really weren't many players in this position. And well, well, speaking of Fernandez, let's talk about his United colleague then, because Marcus, Marcus Rashford really sort of, I think, summed up what this season was all about. We had lots of high-performing yeah. midfielders in and around six point five. And of course, he ended up finishing, I think, 7.2, 7.3, really leaping out of his bracket because he was the chief um, exciting value midfielder this season, would you say? Yeah, he made a mockery out of that uh, initial 6.5 price tag. Um, but he's another player who, it, going through this, it really emphasises how long the season is and how it's, they always say it's a game of two halves, but FPL is a game of two halves because... Rashford is another player who post World Cup was a lot better than beforehand. Uh, because pre Qatar, he had just four goals and two assists. And then on Boxing Day, game week 17, FPL resumes and he scores 10 goals in the next 10 games uh, to have his best ever FPL campaign. So it completely changed after that break. And he peaked at 6.1 million owners. And then what actually happened is after game week 24, he only scored three more times, but I think it took a while to sort of cotton on to the fact that that streak had ended, that explosive streak after the World Cup. And it did sort of, uh, partly because of injury, of course, but it, it did uh, fade slightly by the end. But he's had a, he's a superb season. He's finished on over 200 points which for a player of that initial prize tag is superb. So, yeah, he's, he's been one of the best midfielders we've had. And he sometimes played up front, of course. So, Well, it's an excellent um, little segue into, I guess, what next season does hold for him. Because, yeah, as you say, um, 200 points plus usually is, is good justification to hoik that price back up. I mean, we were all very surprised when we saw him at 6.5. You know, those, those days are, are very much gone. Um, and, and some would argue should never have even come about because <laughs> it was a very kind price. But where would you see him price next season? And I guess the question is, have you seen him play up front enough times to potentially make people a bit nervous that he might get reclassified as a forward? What's your thoughts on that for next season? I think that, well, first of all, is yeah, this season's price drop was probably one of the biggest. And I'd say that for next season, it will, his rise will also be one of the biggest. It depends if Manchester United do buy that striker because we know they are linked with some names. And if they clearly buy a big elite striker up front, then you would imagine that does keep Rashford attacking from the left. And that doesn't necessarily mean he will stay as an FPL midfielder, but uh, I think there's enough doubt about whether he's this or that that maybe they could keep him in midfield. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I would like to keep him there because I think he... It's one of those situations where has he played up front enough times this season to justify the switch? Like, maybe. I feel like it could be borderline. Um, you know, it could go, I could support a case for either way. But in terms of, as you've sort of mentioned a couple of times in these videos, sometimes, you know, we're not just thinking about football here. The people behind FPL have to design a game and they have to think about what will make the game function well. And if you have a situation where Rashford is reclassified as a forward, but every week he plays on the wing because Harry Kane's playing up front for Man United, then it possibly slightly just breaks that part of the game, and that could be potentially enough of a decision. Uh, it might, might be enough to push their decision back towards him being a midfielder again, which I, which I hope is what happens, because um, if United do get a, um, a big, exciting striker, Harry Kane perhaps, I, I'd quite like to own both Rashford and Kane. I think they could link up quite well, so I'll keep my fingers crossed for that. Uh, I do get slightly nervous that um because it was it was another season where there weren't that many great forwards and I often feel like the if there's ever a chance to move more players into that position, they might take that opportunity. I, I think this season we had Jota become a forward and, and Bumo Brentford become a forward. So maybe there's a slight desire to make that position more competitive, but uh, yeah, he might have just not played there quite enough to force the move. Yeah, that's a good point. And but and balancing with those other players also quite um, worth considering in a world where Kane and Haaland uh, really just locked it down uh, for large parts of the season. So he really only had one extra slot 
uh, on average, really, to, to do something with. And if Kane does stay in the Premier League and go to a United, then may well be the same, same issue again. Um, but Rashford is not the only uh, player in his, posi- in his price point, uh, roughly, to have had a good season. And we come now on to um, a, a tr- a, just a veritable trio of exciting uh, assets who they did tell off towards the end, but I don't think Arsenal fans will ever forget um, the first 75 to 80 percent of this season because it really was uh, quite amazing. There's there's a variation in price here. So obviously we've got we've got Erdegaard, we've got Martinelli, we've got Saka. Saka was the more expensive of the three, and Martinelli and Erdegaard were a little bit cheaper, but eventually sort of pushed themselves up with the performances that they gave. Um, I mean, I mean, how do you how do you even separate these three? Um, they've, all three of them had incredible campaigns, really. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know who I, who I would vote for as the one who had the best season from a fantasy perspective, um, without perhaps a little bit of input from yourself, you might be able to drop some really eye-opening stat I'd not thought of that might sway me one way or the other. <laughs> well, certainly Odegaard finished on more points of the trio, and uh, whereas Saka ranked second of the three, but came in at a much higher price. So maybe that will impact the vote a bit because he was as great as Saka has been. The value for money wasn't quite there with the other two. But yeah, Odegaard was um, he's second amongst all midfielders. He's he's reached 212 points, 15 goals, eight assists, quite a lot of double-digit hauls. He got nine of them. Um, it's quite interesting, really. Uh, out of those to score at least 14, Odegaard had by far the fewest big chances. He only had nine big chances. So it sort of does ask the question... Is he here to stay as a big goal scorer or was it just sort of a really good year? Whereas Martinelli, Martinelli actually had one more assist. He had more attacking returns than Odegaard did, but a lot, uh, a lot less bonus points. But Martinelli was interesting because his penalty area touches ranked third, but it were more than any forward in the game. So he was an incredible bargain for so long of the season. He was in five million squads for a long time. Um, but again, it, it did sort of tail off towards the end. And I think we expected Martinelli all along to, oh, he might be rotated with Smith Rowe. And then when Trossard came in, rotated with Trossard. But it didn't really happen for a while. And then when he was eventually put on the bench, what did he do? He came on, he scored. And scored eight goals in the next 10 games. So the lesson is don't annoy Martinelli. <laughs> That's a good point. And well, the, th- the thing that I find really interesting about this trio is I can't really remember the last time that we had three midfielders from the same club sort of in a similar price. I know Saka was just that little bit um, further ahead, but in a season where we always felt quite a flush with cash, there was never a time when I felt like I couldn't get to Saka. Um, you know, so I always had the choice. And this this is what I find really fascinating is I honestly can't remember the last time we had this where we had three very similar, um, similarly uh, exciting assets all from the same club that actually made it really difficult to pick the best one at each particular point in time. And sometimes even made it difficult to pick the best two. And I think that um, comparing it perhaps with Rashford, you know, if if you needed an inform United midfielder when they had good fixtures, it was like Rashford job done. But then with Arsenal, I think maybe this what might maybe influence people's voting somewhat is that the, the, each one of these might just lose a little little bit of support in the vote because they can all remember times when they didn't have that one. And they had the other one and they let them down because obviously between the three, it was always going to ebb and flow about, you know, which one was the best two to own. And I, I had a couple of weeks where I I sold Saka, I think, and uh, sorry, I sold Erdegaard to keep Saka because I wanted to keep, because I needed to move to a Salah or a Fernandez, And... I kept Saka because he was on the penalties and then I ended up having Saka for the two games where he blanked where Martinelli exploded. I think I had Erdegaard before I had Saka in the first place, so just going further back in time. Um, you know, I, I seem to just not always be completely optimally invested in this trio because there was three of them and, and it mm-hmm. always just made it very difficult for me to sort of pick between them. I don't, what was your experience with these guys this year? Did you, did you own all three of them at various stages and in different combinations? Uh, started off with Martinelli. So that, that went well. I don't think... 
Oh no, you know, there was there was a slight spell with Odegaard later on, but it was just when he decided to not score for a little bit. So thank you for that. Um <laughs> Saka, yeah. That's the thing because Saka I did have him for a while because by the way, he's the other player as well as Salah who scored at least ten goals and got ten assists. He's the other he's the only other player with double digits for both. And he had the, the penalty taking responsibility. So I, that really appealed to me. And he, he did okay. He, he did an all right job. But and it, his returns came at a steady pace, Saka. So he produced in 17 of his first 25, although he then failed in all but two since game week 28, I think it was. So, and had him for quite a few of those weeks, of course. But yeah, he was. I've had all of them. You're right in that they could sort of share the Arsenal vote in these awards, but uh, it's another reminder that you can vote for up to five names <laughs> on Scout, by the way. Yeah. So you could you could vote for all three if you wanted to. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, an incredible season for for Arsenal. Uh, unfortunately for their fans, just pipped to the post by Man City, who we move to next. Um, it's a bit of a, an automatic inclusion most seasons, really, for Kevin De Bruyne to, to feature in the shortlist. Um, I don't really think I owned him that much this season, uh, to be honest, um, which was maybe a mistake. Uh, but yeah, what can you tell us about his campaign? Um, yeah, Kevin De Bruyne, the legend that is. Yeah, you're right. It often felt like he was kind of the fourth premium and that as, as, as good as he was doing, um, there was always Haaland, Kane, Salah ahead of him and and it was kind of hard to fit two, maybe three into a lineup. Uh, 18 assists for De Bruyne, which is brilliant and yet it's still only his joint third best tally, which tells you everything about the guy. And there's 183 points, ranks fifth from seven seasons. So again, seven full seasons, not counting the Chelsea. Um, so in that respect, it's been semi-disappointing, but also he is one of the top scoring midfielders. He is incredible when he plays and his link up with Erling Haaland was, as predicted, superb. And uh, he was a victim of late rotations, for sure. That might have pushed him up the rankings a little bit. But he ends with the best rate of chances created. He's created a chance every 24.7 minutes. Um, and he's near the top for creating big chances. The only thing that maybe stopped him being top was those sort of late rotations uh, that restricted his game time. So, yes, we know, we know what we get with De Bruyne. Um, he's he's a brilliant player to watch and he does get the assists in FPL I guess the only thing you could say is that the goals didn't really happen this season he scored 7 which which is okay but uh, compared to the other premium options maybe maybe that's what held him back a little bit yeah, and certainly he, he is capable of having a double-digit season for goals. When you look at um, last season, 15 goals uh, for him. Uh, and then two seasons before that, you know, 13 goals in that one. So it wasn't quite an epic season for him. And the, and the pricing structure of other players really kind of made it... I mean, just I said I'm not sure I owned him. Just going back, I don't think I owned him even once. Uh, but he gets... He still just... It's, sometimes you get these players, you, you go nowhere near for reasons that feel important at the time and in short term because, oh, I need to own this other player. But, you know, you could make a case for sticking him in uh, a team where you just leave him in the whole time and he's going to get you, you know, close to 200 points. Um, the, the, these are the, usually the kind of conclusions that we tend to come to with, at the end of the season sometimes and then we just forget them at the start of the next season you know, we could could have just left this guy in and he could have just ticked along nicely but such is the nature of FPL it's, it's very short term based at times very sort of based around the pressure of other decisions and other players in the game um, so he's probably not going to get I, I don't think he's going to get that many votes in this but, we ha- but he just still has to be on the shortlist doesn't he because it's just forget his other seasons he's, he's, not, he's not really competing against that you know, he's in the top six highest scoring midfielders for the season, so here he is. That's it, yeah. He, he, he has to be mentioned. Uh, but uh, I'd be surprised if he made the lineup. But 
it's not our decision. No, so <laughs> exactly. Let's see what happens. It will be the will of the people uh, that decide it. Um, well, let's go to the complete opposite end of the extreme in terms of price and uh, head back to your favorite part of the world, which is Newcastle, where we uh, have to talk about Miguel Almiron, who uh, we've talked about, um, you know, a season of two halves. We've talked about some guys who had a you know an all right start, but then a much better finish. It was kind of the other way around for for Miggy, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, Miggy, great guy. Um, his first three and a half years at Newcastle were not great. It took him almost a year to score his first goal for the club. So what happened to him in in the autumn was very much a purple patch. And pretty symbolic of, of how things have been under Eddie Howe. Players like Almiron and Joel Linton and Longstaff have just improved incredibly under Howe. And you start off at 5 million. Between game weeks 9 and 17, he scored eight goals in that time. So he shot up in value. But it, it has regressed a bit since, as, as you would probably expect. Um, his final 17 games, two goals, two assists. And sort of looking forward, we, we already saw signs towards the end that he was maybe slightly rotationable, if that's a word. But certainly next season, um, the squad depth should be increased and it probably ends him as a viable FPL asset. That's it. But owners, I'm sure, will not forget that beautiful <laughs> autumn spell. That yeah. We'll have to go the uh, the streets will never forget that is for sure because it, as you said it was so unlikely I think that was the, I remember first getting on 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 the bandwagon and it's still feeling I was very lucky I got on it um, quite early when it was still very much a bandwagon that you sort of turned your nose up at because you know you could just you could feasibly um, negate any reason for jumping on it by just going simply it's Almiron and like that was enough and but that was what was quite handy was that people were simultaneously saying oh it's Almiron whilst kind of overlooking some actually quite good numbers like his underlying stats were were quite good for that patch um, and that's why I invested in on him because historically they hadn't been <laughs> you know yeah. and so it feels quite nice uh, it's sort of a fitting a, a tribute I suppose to the fact that he's probably as you say not going to be that much of an asset next season after being you know, it's sort of this comical figure in the mind of many that he did get one proper go at being a fantasy asset um, before that time. And and here he is on the shortlist. I don't think he's, I think that second half of the season, as you've mentioned, there's probably going to hamper him in terms of getting some votes in the polls, but it feels nice just to have him here just to sort of give him a nice little nod, be like, well done, my friend. Um, yeah, you know, it's probably going to be some, some recency bias, but uh we will not forget. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of recency bias, I do think that we might see that possibly with the Brighton midfielders. You've talked about rotation as well. You know, these guys in many ways were the second half of the season's answer to um, to Almiron. Uh, Solly March in particular as well, someone who historically uh, had just sort of been a five million midfielder you kind of just ignore. But he had his best season uh, in, in a Brighton shirt. Matoma sort of came out of nowhere and has looked very, very exciting. Alexis McAllister as well sort of, has been around for a little while and has always looked very exciting, but um, really had a proper bite at the cherry this year. Could be a bit like the Arsenal guys. We've got three guys all from the same club and they all kind of treaded it on each other's toes at various points. So it'd be interesting to see if any one of the three maybe just finishes above the other two. I don't know. But yeah, um, what do you think about these three guys? Um, they, they very much were the story of the second half of the season. You know, best Brighton midfielders to own. I feel like that was probably inserted into the keywords on many, many fantasy football scout articles since about January. Yeah. Well, first of all, an apology to Pascal Gross, who actually outscored all three of them oh, right. in the end. But um, but it was never glamorous to go with him over these three because they all, each of them offered something. So Solly March, similarly to Almiron, Almiron had never really been a, thought until this season he hadn't scored since November 2020 but then Deserby comes in he's a winger six goals 10 assists and since since that break since since we came back after the World Cup he, he ranks fifth for big chances created and seventh for chances created so so yeah he, he's had a, I don't want to call it a purple patch or anything but his second half of the season was was very good it came out of nowhere um, until injury sort of took him out with the worst time when when those 
double game weeks were coming up. And then Matoma, again, he, he only burst onto the scene after the World Cup break, uh, sort of once Trossard was out of the picture. Um, whereas March is the best of the trio for creativity, Matoma is the best for in the penalty box. He has the most touches in the box of the three, more shots as well. Um, but his points tally since game week 17 is seventh best of all midfielders. So, uh, but the only thing I would say about Matoma is we we all kind of, he was firmly in the template and that was kind of non-negotiable purely because of the double game weeks. But he actually, he only once exceeded seven points after game week 22 and he hadn't scored since game week 29. So he really did sort of drop off. Um, seven points in a match, sorry, because there were some double game weeks. So, in a way, Matoma was slightly disappointing for a lot of the time, but we sort of kept him anyway. Yeah, he became a bit of a, a second half of the season trippier, didn't he? In that yeah. people felt uh, afraid to move him on because everyone else had him. And he always looked like he was this close to getting something. The one thing I noticed about him was that his... His shots in the box and his big chances uh, stats largely stayed at um, what I would consider an investable level, but it was the shots on target that just completely dropped off a cliff and the goal conversion rate as well uh, seemed to be what killed his season in the end. Um, I guess uh, my question in, in, in that regard then, do you feel that McAllister possibly was a bit of a best of both worlds? You know, March was the assister, Matoma when he was on form was the goal scorer, whereas McAllister was probably of the three, the one that offered both of those things in slightly more of a balanced equal measure and of course penalties as well yeah he, he came out on top of the shots and expected goal involvement uh influenced by the penalties yeah of course but uh his 52 shots outside the box were really high so even ahead of ruben neves which which is saying something oh wow um <laughs> oh, there's a stat so so yes he did beat them both for shots but a lot of them were quite speculative but he ended on 10 goals um, and he's had a good year with the World Cup winners medal and now he's about to possibly leave the club. So it be interesting to see how Brighton evolve next season. Mm, absolutely. And uh, we've already touched upon it in our Defenders video, but what happens to the price of some of these players is going to be very, very interesting. And, you know, I completely, I, I must also apologise to Pascal Gross. I had not noticed that either. Um, he very much probably deserves a price rise as well and and actually has some pedigree compared to the others as well. Um, when you consider that there was a time when he was essential beforehand, um, back in the, the real before times of Brighton. So, you know, he could be looking at 6, 6.5 for the new season uh, as well. So what happens with Brighton? You're absolutely right. We're going to have a keen eye on that. Let's uh, finish the, the shortest itself before we go into the honourable mentions with the cheapest member of the list. Probably not going to get too many votes, uh, I would imagine, because he probably was on the bench for a lot of his biggest hauls. But when a 4.5 million uh, midfielder uh, does as well as Andreas Pereira has, he absolutely deserves to be uh, on this list. And it's, it's, quite, it's quite nice to see this because I think that he was someone that we all had our eye on at the start of the season because we all kind of figured that he would probably play in a, a very... Um, advanced number 10 role in a team that was very attacking probably could have been more expensive but wasn't so it's nice to see a 4.5 um do well even if he perhaps was mildly frustrating at how often he was you know sub blocked by probably a jack Grealish cameo or something like that yeah i can't seem to recall was he priced as a manchester united player perhaps uh, yes, I believe he was. Um, I think that's perhaps what influenced the price, actually. Um, and then, so so then when he moved to nugget. Fulham, it felt like a bit of a cheat code, basically, because he was priced as a Man United reserve and then became a, a big Fulham sign. And, and we knew going into the season that he was going to be the 4.5 million of choice, really. And he did prove that. Uh, four goals and 10 assists. Although, as you say, a lot of that would have been stuck on our benches. But what a great feeling when he came in as an auto so with a goal. Yeah. Uh, whenever that happened. He, I think he hauled both times against Leeds, for example. So he, he certainly had some great moments. It's just uh, we might not have experienced them too often. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, whenever a 4.5 million midfielder does, that tends to be their lot in life. But And sadly, probably isn't going to be 4.5 million again next season because I think, yeah, you, I'd, I'd forgotten that, actually. I think you could be right that um, in a Fulham team, if you know he's in the team and then you're doing the prices you're not going to make him 4.5. So he's probably going to be a 5.5 for next season. And, and Fulham are probably another club that we're going to see some some price rises for because they did have a very good year, didn't they? Um, you know, they were priced like a newly promoted team uh, because, uh, but they didn't play like one. And so well done uh, to them because it was never really in the relegation fight at all, really. They sort of weren't, weren't fussed by it. So well done wow. to them. Probably going to have to find a new 4.5 for the new season. Let's finish with some um, some guys that were close had some good patches, especially towards the end, uh, but couldn't quite make the list. Uh, on the screen, I've got Leandro Trossard, who um, you know, famously was a useful asset, actually, for two different teams in the same season. Um, so fair play to him there. Bruno Fernandes, uh, we got Rodrigo as well, and also Eberé Eze, who um, really um, made everybody forget that Zaha was injured, to be honest. He very much filled that void at Palace, didn't he? So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what can you tell us about these guys? Perhaps maybe how they just missed out. Um, and you know, might have been a bit harsh on, on Fernandez, to be honest. Um, when you see where his overall points are compared to some of these other nominees, it, it might be deemed harsh. It just felt like even he, he did lead the way for chances created. And I read a stat earlier that no player had created a bigger XG tally than him, it's just his teammates often didn't score those chances. So but it was it was it was a since his 2020 arrival, he's had three full seasons, and this one sort of felt like it might have been possibly the weakest of the three. But yeah, you, you could argue that he may have deserved to have been in the vote, but at the same time, he might not have received many votes anyway. So yeah, it's um another player where it's a season of two halves in many ways because yeah just looking back at his first half of the season now it didn't really justify that much investment and I picked him up in January when it felt unfashionable at the time because I just had a bit of an inkling that it was about to go on a run and, and, and he did and then people picked up on it but um, in a season where Rashford was so much cheaper and you know clearly much more of a goal threat and you've also got uh, so many uh, really affordable options at Arsenal and Brighton there was just never room for Bruno uh, really until right near the end when you felt forced into that because of the double game weeks uh, or the forced into it's probably the wrong word because you were right he, he was playing well um, I think it was just a season that just conspired for him not being as central to the picture as before because yeah he still scored about 20 more points this season than he did last season um, but it's just that the the changing landscape around him just made him hard to to fit in. Probably would would you say? Yeah, and he, he did, those two goals in his last two matches does sort of end the season not a high for him. But just scrolling down now, just scrolling down the matches, then before those last two games, he'd only scored once in a long, long time. So there was a lot of underachievement before the end. And uh, yeah, he, he's a good player, and he's he's key to Manchester United but perhaps we have to draw the line somewhere on this short list before it becomes a long list and yeah Fernandez is just on the other side of that for us yeah that's very true and well the only thing is is next season probably going to be up to the price he was that we would more expect of him because they finished well and are looking good could be back in a position where we've got some very tough uh, decisions uh, to make uh, for the new campaign. Before we finish, perhaps a slight word on on Eze, um, because not necessarily to suggest that in any way he should be on that short list, but it, I do personally find it very impressive that I feel like he wasn't really in the conversation until about 10 weeks ago, whenever it was that uh, Hodgson came back. And yet Eze has managed to finish in the top 10 amongst all midfielders uh, for points with uh, 159. Uh, it's more than Almiron, more than Trossard as well, more than Son more than March, you know, so he, he did actually, what he achieved in the, in the end of the season, when added on what he'd done before, was was impressive for someone who very much felt like a differential. When you look at where he finished, maybe we should have been on him a little bit more. Yeah, you got you got two 16-point hauls after Hodgson arrived. Um, he, he really sort of had a superb end to the season. And yeah, it's, it's sort of it's a hindsight thing, isn't it? Because you look at him and think, "Wow, it's a lot of points. He, he's he's ranked really highly. Uh, well, why weren't we on him sooner?" But 
his form coincided with Brighton having double game weeks every week. So there was, there was always sort of more bodies in the way, but <laughs> he definitely deserves a mention. Yeah, and I, also I, Rodrigo. Oh, Rodrigo's absolutely. another one. Yeah, not on there because he was he had thirty five points after game week three, an incredible start. He was the first midfielder to reach ten goals, but then he got injured. But he still ends with the best minutes per goal rate of, of the regular midfield starters. So if it wasn't for the injury, he might have been on the list. And Leeds might have stayed up. <laughs> and Leeds might have stayed up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's weird. I, when I saw Rodrigo on the list, my brain immediately went to the Man City midfielder because I, I just honestly completely forgotten about the Leeds one because it, it feels like such a long time ago that he was an option. It almost feels like last season. Well, I mean, technically it is now last season because the season has finished. But, you know, um, it's because his real purple patch really was in the first few weeks of the campaign, which were a very long time ago now. So, um, yeah, shame shame for him, really, because he was an exciting player um, to to own. And, yeah, just, just going back to Eze as well, I think I I, I was big on this guy. I, I, I lost count of the number of like articles, videos, whatever you call it, that I he, I put in front of the center like, this guy's so good, you have to get him. And I just never got him myself. And it, it was because of Brighton. You know, they just had too much of an opportunity to um, to invest in those double game weeks. I just never found the room, which is, is a real shame. So, um, yeah, hopefully I get to own someone like an Eze next season. Uh, if the double game weeks can just get out of the way. Because <laughs> it can be a bit of a chore sometimes, can't they? Yeah, a little bit. Well, hopefully, don't want to speak too soon, but next season might be a bit closer to normality, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> yeah, for the first time. In terms time of no time. World Cup breaks, no... No World Cup breaks. Hopefully, no pandemics. <laughs> so we might actually have a smaller amount of double game weeks in theory, which might give guys like Eze a chance and allow Mitoma to be sold. <laughs> yeah. After all this time, we can finally look elsewhere and just focus on the single game weeks. We can, yeah, absolutely um, pray for that for certain. Um, but yes, as we've uh, talked about here, all these players, uh, with the exception of the last few we've talked about, the ones that are in the shortlist, you can vote for uh, on the polls on fantasyfootballscout.co.uk. Uh, and so it all feeds into that team of the season. So if you head to the website, scroll down to the polls sidebar, and you'll see the different positions cycle through over the next few days. So you can uh, vote for those. And then eventually a team will be assembled uh, by the writers who never stop working. As I said, Mark is uh, still trawling through all of the postseason copies, so make sure you keep an eye uh, on all that stuff. And uh, don't forget, by the way, before you finish, to uh, like this video and hit subscribe uh, on the Fantasy Football Scout YouTube channel and also hit the bell notification as well because in the closed season, there is naturally going to be less football on. There's going to be significantly fewer deadlines as well. So uh, you're slightly just statistically more likely to miss content. If you don't have that bell notification turned on, it will help you know when we've got something new out. Uh, we'll have a video on forwards as well. Uh, we've already discussed defenders and goalkeepers for the team of the season, so you can go back and watch or listen to those depending on what platform you're accessing this on. And also, don't forget that what we have coming up is Game Week 39 on Saturday 3rd of June, Team North versus Team South. All of your favourite content creators from the fantasy football world, probably all of the ones you don't like as well, they're all there um, playing football against each other. Uh, all in a fantastic uh, name name of a fantastic cause uh, that is Street Child United that do a fantastic job of looking after underprivileged uh, children uh, across uh, the world so if you'd like to come to that it's in Birmingham you can go to the website gameweek39 north versus south.co.uk and buy a ticket all proceeds to that charity or if you can't make it but you'd like to make a donation you can do that too and you can follow uh, the game I think on Twitter spaces where it'll be kind of radio commentary and my understanding is that there will be uh, um a, a televisation of the game on YouTube as well. So keep an eye out for that big, big fantasy event and we'd love to have your support um, for that. I think that's everything I've got to mention. That was quite a long list. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, Mark. Um, you've, uh, I think I think you've finished writing all of your Team of the Season articles now. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, the forwards has just been completed. So that will go on the site in the coming days. So yes. Yeah, be nice probably to uh, to have that season review uh, out of the way and you, so you can enjoy the rest of your summer, I imagine. <laughs> It would be nice. It's good to avoid burnout, I think, in general. Although there's a different type of burnout if you sort of go on holidays and stuff. So. <laughs> that is very true. Well, as I said, thanks for, for coming on this video. And we've got one more with you to come later this week. So, um, yeah, everybody will see you then. Uh, but until then, it's a goodbye from me. And a goodbye from me. Cheers all. <laughs>